moving on, I have a, a another uh, op-ed piece. This is going in a different direction, but we're uh, checking in on an old friend of the show, Donna Brazil. You guys remember when yeah, we... Yeah, uh, One of our we, favorite friends. One of our favorite friends. You remember when we read her book with David Roth? That was one of my, my favorite episodes of mm-hmm. a recent vintage. Uh, she has a, a beautiful mind and a way with words, and uh, she's putting it on display right now for USA Today in an opinion piece titled... Democrats stripped my superdelegate powers. No, Democrats stripped my superdelegate superpowers. Superpowers. So settle down. She's so awesome. She's so awesome because like the argument with the superdelegate thing, like the DNC line was like, oh, actually, no, this is very normal. It's just like a way for uh, seniority and blah, blah, blah. And actually, it's like the same as a regular vote. Actually, it's less. But she's like, I was mortal. They took it from me. <laughs> like She rocks. I love her. She goes, now I'm a notch above a coin toss. And then, like, the subhead is this. Holy rusted metal. The Democrats strip powers from superdelegates. I earned my place at this table. (laughs) There's a reason we're called the party faithful. I Uh, love that. I earned my place by being the most incompetent single human being in the history of the DNC. Well, and also her place is very much based on this consolidation of power at the top. Like, she's like, how dare they? I'm supposed to have, like, a completely unbalanced degree of power in an undemocratic way. I help, I help make sure that we lost the easiest election layup in history. You do got to give it to her, though, because it's like the, the thing that annoys me is that fucking smarmy Democrat line where it's like, yeah, I may have a disproportionate vote share, but I'm representing millions that are never heard from. I am their voice. I'm, I represent everyone. I'm... A I'm humble every servant of the people. Yeah, yeah. And Donna Brazil's like, what the fuck? I had seat check. <laughs> what? Did, I was here. Like, it just, at least she's just putting it out on the table. I appreciate that a lot. Yeah. yeah. No, and she's to like be fair, Dr. Manhattan of the Democrats. She's, <laughs> yeah. she is. She's fun. Yeah. To be, and to be fair to Donna, I don't think it's fair to say, I don't think Donna is as incompetent as Debbie Washing Machine Show. Oh, absolutely oh, not. That would be absolutely hard. I mean, not. according to her self uh, justifying memoir, no. <laughs> well, I believe everything in her self-justifying yeah, no, memoir, though. I 100% buy it. Yeah. So she goes here. Uh, she continues with this, like, Adam West Batman style of writing. <laughs> uh, curses. Superdelegate is vanquished. <laughs> and then what, what, what does holy rusted metal refer to? Oh, you don't remember that line? That's no. from Batman uh, uh, re- Batman, re- Batman Forever. When uh, it's wow. it's a it's a cheap uh, it's a very awkward attempt to do a throwback reference to the seven sixties TV show where they used to say like holy whatever Batman. There's a scene where they're towards the end and they're going into I think the Riddler's den and they see some rust and they're on the thing and it's raining and uh, it's Robin a Robin says joke. Robin says holy must rusted metal Batman and Batman goes what and you think oh it's like holy whatever but it goes the, the, there's there's a uh, there's holes in the in the metal here. Which oh. is an awful pun. Yeah. Holy rusted metal, Batman! Huh? The ground, it's all metal, it's full of holes, you know? Holy! Oh. Yeah. No, it's not from the original, okay. it's from the Batman and Robin. So we've established Batman forever, <laughs> goddammit. <laughs> it's the third one. Why can't they just be one, two, three? Fuck. We've established Donna Brazil as a fan of the Joel Schumacher Batman films. <laughs> okay. I like those nipples on the suit. I don't care. Curses. Superdelegate is vanquished. I've had my wings clipped, my cape ripped, and my superpower stripped. My irresistible kung fu grip on the Democratic Party is being pried loose by well-meaning citizens who may yet endanger the very fountainhead of their freedom. Oh, boy. This is, like, weirdly, I mean, the word fountainhead aside, (laughs) but, like, this is, like, a weirdly kind of fascistic language in terms of, like, look, I am the only thing that is keeping, you know, my kung fu grip on, on the party is the only thing that, that keeps you safe. I, 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 of course, have not read this, but I'm assuming she's using irony. She's saying, actually, the more that I hear of this, the more I'm assuming it's going to be like, oh, I actually, you know, it wasn't that powerful, but just like, I come on, that, I like my snacks. I think that may be where it's going. Yeah. She says here, you see, since time immemorial, we superdelegates have stood as the guardians and protectors of the secret machinations of the Democratic Party. Yeah, keeping it, oh, okay. keeping yeah. it safe from outsiders and agitators, we were ever watchful, always ready to spring into action should unorthodoxy rear its ugly head. But now, a simple Democratic National Committee vote has effectively left us neutered, stripped of our awesome powers, left helpless and weak like Superman zonked by the kryptonite. 
Batman without his utility belt, or a hammerless Thor. She's 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 loving these comic book yeah, references. Holy shit. Donna, check out Preacher. Awesome comic book. Okay. I don't actually read a lot of comic books. I've More been, than me. I've oh been my too God, busy. She's a fake gamer girl. <laughs> I've been too busy running the Democratic Party by executive fiat, along with other Politburo insiders. I mean, superdelegates. At least that's the way it's been explained to us. Last weekend, the DNC voted to essentially disenfranchise the superdelegates, the elected officials, activists, and leaders who go to the Democratic Convention as unpledged delegates, free to support whomever their conscience demands. Many strident voices blame superdelegates for the fact that Bernie Sanders didn't win the 2016 presidential nomination, even though Hillary Clinton won a clear majority of the elected delegates. In fact, neither their introduction in 1984 have superdelegates overturned the choice of elected delegates. We're not Donna, there- I know you had a bad day at work, but Jesus Christ. She's just bitching about office politics. We're not there to circumvent the will of the voters. We're simply there to vote. Well, not anymore, we're not. According to the new rules, we superdelegates won't be able to vote on the first ballot at the convention, or on any ballot, unless there's a tie sum or some other deadlock in the process. So we superdelegates are what now? Merely the mechanism you default to in case of a tie? Great. I fought for the Democratic Party my entire life, and now I'm one notch above a coin toss. So, Well, but- well I mean, this is, you know, I hardly give a fuck about this. I think the superdelegate fight, it, talk about rearranging deck chairs, but... You know, it is one of those things like when Perez ran against Ellison and the line was like, well, they're, they they believe the same things. OK, well, why the fuck did you run that guy? OK, so if the superdelegates make no difference, why do they exist? And why is it so horrible that she's ha- be having this power stripped if it's not meaningful, if it's never going to come into use, Yeah. if it doesn't determine the outside? And of course, you know, this is obvious, but the whole point of the real point of the superdelegates is not necessarily to sway the outcome at the end, but to influence the outcome along the way by by padding the fucking delegate total of one of the candidates, which is what happened during the Clinton-Sanders thing. Every time they showed delegate counts, even though they were relatively close in terms of uh, pledged delegates who were won in primaries and caucuses, Hillary had this giant hundreds and hundreds of delegate lead because they counted all of the superdelegates who had pledged to vote for her. So that's where the influence comes in. But also, there is no influence, but it's also an outrage that I don't have power anymore yeah. that isn't actually power. I mean, she's using... It, I, I only want this small little thing, but I'm furious that it's gone. And she's using, like, the, the superhero language, yes, ironically, to be like, oh, you think, I, you think I'm, like, Thor or Batman or, uh, you know, one of your caped uh, crusaders? Well, no, it, I'm, I'm really not. I'm just... I just work for the party and want what's best for everyone, even though I don't really have that much power. But like you said, I'm really mad now that I don't have it anymore. I realize that many people have felt left out. Part of the reason is that they have not participated, worked and fought to the same degree as many other people. A political party isn't some sort of event planner that's there to make you sure you have a fun time installing the candidate of your choice. It's an organization made up of flesh and blood people who have spilled endless blood, sweat and tears. I Wait, like that it's sentence. Spilled blood? It's made it's made up of flesh and blood people who have spilled tons of their own flesh and blood. <laughs> Those... They're just leaky sacks. <laughs> it's 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 they're not superheroes, they're blood bags. They're blood bags hooked up to the party doing uh they're all they got O, o positive universal donor just being hooked up and just bleeding their veins Kinda. into the corpse of the Democratic Party. <laughs> These people have literally devoted their lives to creating this organization to fulfill their dreams, to fulfill their dreams of the kind of country we're going to be. There is a reason they're called the party faithful. Yeah, because they believe in something they can't see and don't really know is real or not. (laughs) Um, In one of my tweets this week, I used Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards as an example. He has devoted his life to public service, both in uniform and in office. As governor since 2016, he expanded Medicaid to give health care to thousands of Louisianans. He, hasn't, he wasn't given a seat at the table. He earned it. And the superdelegates super aren't the infamous smoke-filled room full of old white men deciding the fate of everybody else. But let me tell you something. It was once close to being that. I know because I helped change it. As I said earlier this week, I've been those people outside shouting at the gate. I was with Jesse Jackson in 1984, an outsider, a troublemaker and believer in the Rainbow Coalition. We complained and we fought and we worked like hell for years to get on the DNC. In I like that to- she thinks the Rainbow Coalition was like the weather underground or something. <laughs> I, got, I do 
do want to say, though, as the son of a prominent uh, Jackson 88 supporter, <laughs> and I think Angela Davis in 92 and 96, I'm trying to remember how my dad voted, but uh, Jesse Jackson wins in 88. We're a far better country. Our show doesn't need to exist. I could have just joined my true call of pro gaming. God knows how, how it would be. He would have been. He was the best one out of that pile. Hundred fucking percent. It was a pile, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now that POC women and LGBTQ leaders have a significant say in the nomination process, suddenly the rules need Wait a to be minute, changed. Well, then it's okay. Say in the Hold well, on no, she's it's... saying that she's saying it used to be like that, but yeah. I fought to make the super delegate process more diverse. Now that, yeah, now but that she's it's saying diverse. it still it has an influence on the. She's saying it, now that they have. She's saying the people who got into the DNC. They're more diverse, but now that they have a big say, she just said earlier that it doesn't matter, and now she's saying they have a, a, a powerful. What was what's the quote? Now that they have a significant significant say. say. So what is it? Is it meaningless? Is it not determinative, or is it a significant say? It's sort of a liminal state. Right? <laughs> I uh, mean, to be honest, like none of this is going to change anything anyway. There's just it's just going to be a less formalized kind of whatever whip procedure that oh, yeah. happens behind behind closed. Oh doors. yeah, no, totally. Suddenly, the rules need to be changed, effectively eliminating their participation. Funny how that happens. Lucy moves the football again. My dear friend and co-author, Leah Daughtry, tweeted she this She has week, not read anything amen. for anyone over the age of 18. <laughs> All of the people lumped together as superdelegates have made the DNC an organization that everyone can be proud of. I invite people to become more involved with it, not to try to make others less involved. No, like, isn't the whole thing about the Superdome thing is that people want to be more involved, is, so they have to take away the power of these weird, unelected super Democrats? Yeah. Who, like, have yeah. some... No, but that, that's the thing. She's inside of it, so she can only think in those terms. She can only think of who's in the DNC and how it's, it's diverse. Not the idea that there are people outside of the actual literal party who want an influence in the way that their part their candidate the candidates are chosen in the party that they support it's weird though because the democratic party it's not an old it's not a real party in the traditional sense so there's them. this weird inside outside thing and, and she's clearly focused entirely on this incredibly small group of people on the inside of it and, i mean the idea that the, the diversity there is more important than the diversity of the people actually voting in these primaries none of whom are in the democratic party is absurd to some degree there has, this has been a perception problem. People seem to think that we th seem to think that we superdelegates really did have some sort of superpowers. Maybe it was the super part of superdelegates that spooked them. <laughs> they began to fear and so distrust us. Objects. We've wound up being outcast and despised like those with superpowers in the X Men universe. Right, settle the fuck <laughs> down. You, that's it. That's, you got it, Don. Uh, yes, you Bernie got Sanders it. is building giant sentinels with laser <laughs> eyes Dude, to hunt down and destroy all the superdelegates. Uh, I, I believe the better comparison would be Muir Island. I would love to see the sequel to Logan, Donna. <laughs> <laughs> Just, oh, man. Just no, she says... She says, we've become outcast and despised like those with superpowers in the X-Men universe, I think. Like I said, I don't actually read a lot of comics. Yes, you do. You You're you nailing all of these That's all dude. you read. This is such She's a like, you know, some may think that we're actually like the Hellfire Club or maybe uh, the uh, cybernetic assassins uh, Omega Red. <laughs> well, you, you know, a lot of I don't read a lot of comics. Well, you know, a lot but of Jim Lee's run on X-Men was uh, <laughs> Well, you know, a lot of these a lot of these party outcasts, they think they're the good guys cuz they're so morally pure, but if you actually know the story, they're sort of like Rorschach. They're actually you know, you get to meet them, they're a psycho. Like I said, I don't really like comics at all. <laughs> I never have ever read one. It, it's this is such good like even when she's just you in know, USA just... Today article form, even when she's just in USA Today article form she's still like pure donna because this yeah. is all comic book references and she's like yeah i've literally never read one ever i don't I, know what the fuck they are we all have like a great deal of affection for this person we don't really love in charge her. of anything but let's think of it this way wouldn't you like to hear six thousand words about what donna brazil thinks of rob liefeld yeah oh my god what's with all those pouches <laughs> <laughs> Do oh dude let Donna write a Spawn reboot. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And like, oh, no, like Todd McFarlane did on the HBO show, every, every episode begins with like her in a dark lit room turning around being like, how would you feel if you're the party you loved and worked for went to fucking hell? <laughs> <laughs> went to fucking hell 
and was made an assassin for Satan himself? What if the party you loved came back to Earth and found that its wife had moved on? How would you feel? What would you do? She's, man, I like, out of all, like, the, like so many shitty Democrats, just soulless people. Just fucking nothing. Just d- dead glass eyes. Just pure transaction their whole fucking lives. Everything they do is just a climber activity. They don't enjoy anything. And then you just have... Donna, who's so wonderfully weird and like has like this. And she was clearly under the impression they were all in it together. Yeah, it's just shocking. It's heartbreaking. It's fucking heartbreaking. But Donna rocks. And I mean that fucking earnestly. I love Donna. (laughs) She closes it out by saying, Well, I can still go to the convention as a superdelegate and do everything in my power to help Democrats win elections. I earned my place at this table. Hell, I helped build the table. So when you're sitting at it without me, Please use coasters. I don't want any stains on it. What? You what? rule. You fucking what? rule. I love you. To go from a extended comic book superhero metaphor <laughs> to one about home decor at the end. That's an amazing. There's that's like a alpha move what does that rhetorically. Mean, what do the coasters represent? Uh, comedy. I don't know. Not being nice. What's the uh, I, what's, what Joe kind Biden? of varnish is on the coffee uh, table? I don't know. The, uh, they- like the, the ringed coffee stains on the table she built, that, that represents the violator played by John Leguizamo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, producer Chris is just uh, handing me this bit of breaking news. I was going to say that. I was going to say did you actually edit in some of that X-Men music? Okay. Coming up soon, September 21st, uh, a free admission event in, uh, where is this? The Florida. In Florida. So if you're in Florida, at, at N- NFSF, Not Safe for Work Corporation, State College Foundation, uh, Palin and Brazil, bridging the political divide. Sarah Palin See, and Donna Brazil. Yep. The GOP's first female vice presidential candidate, Sarah Palin, and the first African-American to head a presidential campaign, Donna Brazil, are political trailblazers known for speaking their minds. In this, yeah, powerful com- in, these, in this powerful conversation, two of the most respected women in American politics. Totally. Whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down. Question. But I also like, no, this conversation will be insanely powerful. I, dude, I, <laughs> this is like, they are, they're going to have this. I'm putting I, on Cerebro right now and I'm <laughs> feeling the vibrations coming off this conversation. It's not even going to be a debate, though. It's just going to be this bizarre thing. Like, it's going to start out like maybe 10 minutes political. Then it's going to be like, by hour or two, it's just going to be like, here's what it really means to be someone's aunt. <laughs> Like right. <laughs> fucking weird. Donna's going to crack open a canned rosé and like it's just these are these are they're very much a different of different variation on the same kind of loon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like they were the right person for their time and they don't understand they ha- they're not very cynical. So they don't understand that they are there for optical purposes. It's going to rule. Sarah Palin is going to end up yelling about some guy who promised to buy Todd's truck and then backed <laughs> out of it at the last minute. And, oh, Sarah Palin and is Donna's walking gonna be talking. on. She's just going to recapitulate the plot of Sisterhood of a Traveling Pants, which she watched the <laughs> night before in the hotel room. <laughs> it's going to rip. There's going to be a giant box of wine in the middle of the table. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. The, I hope all the Palins are in the audience just get into fights have another fight over some snowmobile <laughs> bullshit that ah fa- oh, i love that family we already talked about yeah, them yeah. but it's like that is i would i would max out my contribution to a sarah Palin super pack just because i want i want like facebook bullshit to be the animating the next political meta is at least i raise my kids because you know they're going to be able the bridging that divide means they're both going to come out hard against fake friends they're oh, agree yeah. on that. No, totally. They will That's both agree about, you know, them, those yeah. people, they're behind, they smile to your face, you turn your back, and then they just put the knife right in there. And Donna's like, oh, I know all about that. Uh, Sarah Palin reminds me of, she's like all the women who watch Sons of Anarchy and are like, Gemma's fucking badass. <laughs> <laughs> That's her. I think the pr- political divide is going to be bridged when they uh, both come together over their shared love of Alan Moore's run on Swamp Thing. <laughs> I, I don't read comics, by the way. <laughs> by the way, this is not a one-off. This is part of some sort of cockamamie tour. Because I was looking for the article to just bring it up. When, uh, and I, the first hit was something that happened, 
I guess like four or five months ago at the University of Houston. So they're fucking touring with this shit, which means people are coming out. To, I mean, we would enjoy it. But if you're a regular person trying to understand the political moment and you went to this, what the fuck could you possibly take away from it? Like, I don't know. They came on stage and they started uh, drinking really quickly. And then they were hollering about headphones. I didn't really understand it. I need if this is comes anywhere on the northeast we're going. Like I <laughs> oh, hope absolutely. you know that we're going. But it it does. I mean, I think we're back to this. There's some question as to whether or not uh we have gone past like, you know, the stage of capitalist realism where there is like, you know, no future or whatever, but no, we're definitely stuck in a loop. Like Steve Bannon is back, Sarah Palin is back. People are like nostalgic for like the bushes. Like there's no sense of a future. People Mm-mm. can't envision anything past this moment. So much so that a few of them have gone literally backwards. Like Sarah Palin is irrelevant. Steve Bannon are irrelevant. And they're trying to do like walk-ons from people who left the show like fucking two seasons ago. We all need to uh get out of this loop. Walk through the walls like a Kitty Pride Shadow Cat. All right, so that about does it for this.